Can you hear me? All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having your masks on unless you're up here talking. In the front row, can you quiet it down, please? <laughs> Hi, I'm Brenda Marston, curator of the Human Sexuality Collection, and I'm so happy to welcome you to the celebration of Radical Desire, the exhibition that um, features the work of the women who created the magazine On Our Backs in 1984. And it's really exciting that a number of the women who are involved in that project are here today in person and virtually. If you were involved, you know, raise your hand. <laughs> and um, they will be on a panel tomorrow in Goldwyn Smith Hall, um, so the fun will continue. First of all, I want to thank my co-curator, Katie Edelman Frankel, who had the idea, it was her idea to do this exhibition in the first place, and it's been my honor to, to work with her. And she really brought her expertise as a curator of photography to our really wonderful, creative, and fun collaboration. Uh, together, we hope to display how the photography in On Our Backs helped deliver on the magazine's promise of entertainment for the adventurous lesbian. <laughs> In these photographs, we saw imagination, humor, lots of satire, rigor, radicalism, political engagement, fantasies, and an ethos of community building and inclusion that we think defined the creators of On Our Backs. And that also made a huge contribution to sex positive feminism. This symposium also celebrates the 30th anniversary of Cornell's LGBT studies program and the 50th anniversary of Cornell's feminist gender and sexuality studies program. And I wanna thank both of those pro programs for being part of my life here at Cornell all these years, and also for co-sponsoring these events along with the newer and equally fabulous public history initiative. I want to acknowledge the Cornell people who made so much of our collecting in the area of sex positive feminism possible by introducing me to Susie Bright. Those people are the late Ann R. Kenny, who was a former head of the Cornell University Library, and her friend Beth Anderson, class of 80, uh, who is currently a Cornell trustee and is a retired executive vice president of Audible, where Susie works. Susie has a fierce commitment to saving this history and is responsible for many of the archives and many of you being here today. So thank you, Susie. Before I hand things over to Juno Salazar Perenas, who will introduce our esteemed guest, Gail S. Rubin, I must thank her college friend, Professor Emerita of History, Itzy Hull, not only for nudging Gail for several decades to come visit <laughs> Cornell Library, <laughs> um, but also for being the historian at Cornell who demonstrated to university leadership that sexuality was a subject worthy of historical study and um, convinced the university that the library should accept the sexuality archives being offered to them in the early 1980s. Thank you, Itzy. Juno is an assistant professor of science and technology studies and the feminist gender and sexuality studies program at Cornell. Hello, welcome. <laughs> welcome everybody. So they say that Cornell is such a um, 
spread out institution that it takes an outside visitor to bring Cornell's community together. So it's a delight to see the feminist, queer, and sex positive communities coming together for Gail Rubin in this room, yeah. in this library, and in this esteemed institution. So give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Cornell is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayo Cajono, who are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of the university, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayo Cajono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection to Gayo Cajono people, past and present, and to these lands and waters. So it's important for all of us to remember that institutions with oppressive histories can help forge liberatory futures. So in that spirit, it's my great pleasure to get to introduce Professor Gail Rubin. She's too modest to admit this, but seriously, her writing launched feminist and queer studies. Traffic in women, <laughs> she's, she's rejecting it, but it's true. So traffic in women, which she wrote in grad school, gave us the framework to understand the sex gender systems. And her essay, Thinking Sex, gave us the language to think of sexuality as a vector of oppression. So seriously, I am so indebted to her. I'm sure many of you are indebted to her for this too. So I had the privilege of being her undergraduate student uh, in the late 1990s. So uh, this was in Santa Cruz. I took two classes with her because I loved her so much <laughs> as a professor. And it was in her seminar studying sexual subcultures that she said the super memorable quote to me. And okay, you have to remember that she is a very serious anthropologist. So she said, quote, and I remember it so well, I can direct quote it. Social scientists can make anything boring, including sexuality. <laughs> <laughs> <End quote. laughs> but her thinking and her writing uh, and her teaching were never boring um, because her ideas were always rooted in careful and rigorous analysis of both written words, uh, historical texts and images, and embodied experiences. And so please join me in giving an enthusiastic welcome to professor and living icon, <laughs> Gail Rubin. Wow. <laughs> uh, how's the volume on this? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. And thank you, Juno. Uh, for those wonderful introductions. And thank you, Brenda, for bringing me here to this remarkable collection. And I have to say, it has really been a thrill to finally visit and see the riches, uh, the archival and documentary and artifactual riches that have been accumulated here at Cornell on the topics of sexuality. I'm grateful to the library and the co-sponsors of this talk and to Joan Lubin and Brenda for organizing this week's festivities and to the many wonderful staff of Cornell's rare and distinctive collections who have made time this week to speak to me and show me around. It's been wonderful. It, it is like visiting the Vatican Library <laughs> of Sex. <laughs> and it's quite wonderful to be here. So for this talk, uh, I'm going to revisit a somewhat traumatic period in my life as a scholar and an activist the feminist sex wars of the late 1970s and early 1980s. And I'm going to particularly focus on one area, one of the major sites of contention and contestation, that was the bitter and acrimonious conflict over pornography. I should have titled this talk, The Feminist Porn Wars, because in fact, the sex wars were much more extensive than the fight over porn. And just to highlight a few of the areas that people were fighting about, one of the first, was the attempt to either marginalize or expel lesbians from the mainstream women's movement, as such that lesbians had to resist exclusion uh, from organizations such as NOW, National Organization for Women. Having resisted uh, expulsion, the lesbian, some lesbians returned the favor by questioning heterosexuality and claiming that there was no legitimate feminist heterosexuality. 
Um, there were some straight women who also made that argument. Then there were discussions of what was properly feminist lesbianism, which resulted in the denigration of butch femme roles in relationships and the assertion that these were merely rehashed versions of heterosexual arrangements. There were debates over penetration. And was this just a remnant of male supremacy? Was it okay for lesbians to do that? Was sexual fantasy permissible? There was actually an argument that fantasy dehumanized and objectified one's partner, so fantasy was not a good thing to do, which put into also uh, put masturbation in question, although I don't remember reading any specific anti-masturbation text. One of the nastier and more persistent disputes of the, of the 70s was over transsexuals. That was the term at the time, terminology particularly the presence of trans women in feminist and lesbian gatherings. One of the earliest of these surfaced, I believe it was 1973, at the West Coast Lesbian Conference in Los Angeles, where a, a trans woman named Beth Elliott was one of the participants and organizers and was denounced by, among others, Robin Morgan. Um, and then in the late 1970s, the presence of a trans engineer for the, who was working for the lesbian recording company, Olivia Records, occasioned another outpouring of anti-trans sentiment, much of which was more or less codified in Jan Raymond's 1979 book, The Transsexual Empire. Antagonism to trans men surfaced only later in the late 1980s after trans men by the name of Lou Sullivan organized a group called F to M for female to male, which was an organization for trans men and, and uh, for female to male cross-dressers. This raised the visibility of trans men. They hadn't, there had been trans men certainly around before that, but it wasn't such a visible population. And as soon as they were visible, they then became targets. And similarly, during the mid to late seventies, there was an increasing visibility of SM lesbians. And that then occasioned a rash of anti-SM opinion in the lesbian and feminist press and in lesbian communities. One of the ironies of all of this is that uh, this criticism of sexual acts, of gender identities, of erotic roles has contributed to a kind of stereotype, an erroneous one, I believe, of the women's movement of this period and especially lesbian feminism as largely grim and puritanical and hostile to sexual pleasure. And while that description might be act, apt for some, it could not be more incorrect. Women's liberation and then lesbian feminism were hotbeds of sexual enthusiasm. The pursuit <laughs> <laughs> and the pursuit of lust was probably as intense as the pursuit of political goals. And the two were often entangled, energizing one another. You know, I can't tell you how many uh, couples came out of demonstrations and so forth. It, it was uh, there's a lot of sexual energy in the movement. So while there was this critical condemnation of sexual practices and gendered expressions, there were also workshops on how to achieve orgasm. There were workshops on how to masturbate. The late Betty Dodson, you know, was a, a crusader for masturbation. Uh, there were uh, uh, there, there were sessions, including some university classes, on how to look at one's sexual organs so they would be less mysterious. There were campaigns against the monogamy, both in the feminist movement and then in the lesbian feminist movement. Monogamy, you know, had this, uh, there was a criticism that it was like private property. And I remember as late as 1986, I was at the National Organization of Women Convention in Denver, Colorado, and there were these little tables, you know, where people were selling stuff. And there was one woman who had a button, I will never forget. It said monogamy, monopoly, monotony. <laughs> that was at a now convention. <laughs> there were also feminist and lesbian artists and craftswomen busily creating erotic images and objects, and then feminist sex shops such as Eve, Eve's Garden in New York, and of course, Good Vibrations in San Francisco, open to provide retail access to sex equipment and information. And these are just a few examples of this very lively and vibrant feminist and lesbian sexual culture that was about to encounter, coming from the other direction, the anti-porn movement, which erupted right around 1977. And I'm gonna focus on the anti-porn movement for a few reasons. First, it's an important context for the emergence of On Our Backs, the subject of this astonishing exhibit next door and uh, the focus of tomorrow's panel with many of the founders and producers. 
Second, the conflicts over pornography expanded rapidly and the issue of porn became sort of like a giant planet, a huge entity whose gravity then pulled other issues into its orbit. I keep thinking of Jupiter with the moon circling around Jupiter. So this had the effect of, of making some issues more uh, prominent and making others less salient at the time. So for example, SM imagery was highlighted because it was uh, indispensable to the anti-porn claims. So that was something that uh, was highlighted by the anti-porn movement. And at the same time, there was a lot less focus, there was a lot more focus on heterosexuality as opposed to in, insufficient or inadequately feminist, uh, ostensibly inadequately feminist lesbianism. Uh, lesbian sex practices were not spared condemnation, but there was a lot less talk about them. Uh, trans issues continued to smolder, but have more recently, of course, become uh, the sort of leading bleeding edge of fights over alternatives to heteronormativity, not only among feminists, but of course, the conservative right, which has unleashed this unprecedented barrage of legal and regulatory assaults on trans folk, especially trans kids. The third reason I want to focus on the feminine, on the anti-porn movement is that um, these feminist sex wars of the 70s and 80s have been getting a good bit of attention lately, and there's a growing literature that purports to tell their histories and take lessons from uh, these alleged historical accounts. A few of these uh, recent books would be Lorna Bracewell's Why We Lost the Sex Wars, Brenda Kostman's The New Sex Wars, and the one getting the most attention at the moment, and whose name I may mispronounce, um, Amia, is it Srinivasan or Srinivasan? Uh, the Right to Sex. And with respect to the last book, I have to recommend Lisa Dugan's amazingly superb review, which appeared in December in the Boston Review and is also available, I think, by way of the Substack, uh, Kami Pinko Queer. <laughs> Uh, in addition to its overall insight, Lisa's review covers aspects of the sex wars that I'm not addressing today, and particularly the central role of queer desires as sites of contestation and all of this. So I'm going to kind of focus in on the porn wars, but there's a lot more going on. These newer books have uh, joined um, uh, some of the earlier literature, such as Carolyn Bronstein's 2012 Battling Pornography, a couple of anthologies edited by Bronstein, Lynn Camella and Whitney Strube, or Strub. Uh, there have been special issues of Signs, GLQ, and an issue of Communications Review, which is devoted to the now heavily mythologized Ninth Scholar in the Feminist Conference held at Barnard College on April 24th, 1982. And I just realized three days ago that that was the 40th anniversary of the Barnard Conference. So we're 40 years and three days <laughs> from the <laughs> From that 40th anniversary, from that anniversary, and it was a the Barnard uh, conference was a watershed event. The moment that the sex wars that had already been raging on the West Coast for several years exploded onto the East Coast, and because it was New York, people often think this was the beginning of the sex wars. And I, <laughs> I will remind you of that wonderful cartoon, "The View of the World from Ninth Avenue," where nothing really happens until it's you know uh, east of Ninth Avenue and in New York. In any event, as all of this work accumulates, the histories of these events are being codified and ossified, and unfortunately, much of the received narrative about these disputes, actions, ideas is mistaken, partial, distorted, and frankly wrong. I myself have not yet had time to fully digest these newer publications and have dipped in, only dipped into them, but even a cursory look reveals some howlers of just some basic mistakes. So I'm gonna give you a few. <laughs> For example, in Lorna Bracewell's book, she states the following, quote, sex radical feminists like Gail Rubin and Amber Hollabell threw their lot in with civil libertarians like Nadine Strossen and David Richards to form the feminist anti-censorship task force known as FACT. <laughs> this is, there's no footnote for this statement. <laughs> so I can't fathom where she got this, but it's completely wrong. First of all, I had nothing to do with it. I was 3,000 miles away in California, and this was mostly a group of New Yorkers, New York feminists, who mobilized specifically to oppose the McKinnon-Dworkin-style ordinances as these began to proliferate 
Uh, I am, I wasn't there, so, but I am almost certain that neither Amber Hollabell nor Strosen nor Richards were involved in the founding of FACT. I do know that among the founders yeah, were Carol Vance and Ann Snittow, and that Lisa Dugan and Ann Hunter were key figures in the work of the organization. Um, and I should note that Lisa, Nan, and Carol authored an article that was first published in 1985 called False Promises, which is the classic essay explaining why the McKinnon Dworkin ordinances were a really bad idea, especially for feminists and queers. And that essay has been reprinted a number of times, and it's just central reading for anyone interested in these issues. It was just as sharp, it's as sharp today as it was years ago. Um, Similarly, in the Srinivasan book, she has a very garbled account of the founding of New York Women Against Pornography, or WAP. She says that emerging out of the protest against the snuff movie in 1976, whereas WAP was founded three years later in 1979, after a series of other organizations, and it was directly preceded and inspired by the San Francisco group, Women Against Violence in Pornography and Media, or WAPAM, and elsewhere, um, Srinivasan refers to feminist campaigns against porn in the 1960s. I cannot think of any organized feminist antagonism to porn in the 1960s. And again, there's no citation to this claim, so I can't tell what the heck she's talking about. And then there was this from a review of Srinivasan by Maggie Doherty that was in The Nation. She says, well, it's a completely garbled account of the Barnard Conference and the protests that followed that occasion that <laughs> almost destroyed it. According to Dougherty, quote, at the 1982 Barnard Conference on Sexuality, the organizers planned a panel discussion on pornography and politically incorrect sex featuring pro-sex feminists like Gail Rubin and Carol Vance. The panel was met by protests from anti-porn feminists who showed up on campus the day in question. They wore shirts, this part is correct, they wore shirts, shirts, t-shirts that read for a feminist sexuality on the front and against SM on the back and insisted that the conference had been organized by sexual perverts who supported patriarchy and child abuse, unquote. Let me count some of the errors. <laughs> First of all, the protest wasn't against any single panel, it was against the conference as a whole. Second, there was no panel on pornography and politically incorrect sex. There were not really panels, there were workshops. And there was a workshop on pornography. Uh, here it is uh, from the diary of the conference. The, the diary of the conference was the program. And we have a copy here, which I've just donated to the Human Sexuality Collection, if anyone wants to look at it. They already had one in the Honey Lee Cottrell papers, but this one will be cataloged uh, separately. In any event, uh, uh, there was this panel on pornography and there was one on politically incorrect sex, but neither Carol nor I were involved in either one of them. The porn panel was Betty Gordon and Kaja Silverman, and uh, I'm sorry, workshop, I'm already getting this language wrong, the workshop uh, on porn was uh, run by Betty Gordon and Kaja Silverman, and the workshop on politically incorrect sex featured Dorothy Allison, Joan Nessel, uh, Myrta Quintanales and Muriel Demon, and I think I have, yes, Morgan's photo. And let's see if I can tell you. Um, Joan, Muriel, Joan, Myrta, Dorothy. And I don't know who this is. Jan Boney. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. So Carol was the academic coordinator of the entire conference, and I did a different workshop. Uh, an early version of my essay, Thinking Sex. And by the way, one of the accusations against the conference was a hotbed of s and The most s and there was at the conference was the little uh, Tom of Finland image that I included on my diary page. <laughs> um, there was indeed a protest documented extensively in the literature and by Morgan Gwenwald's photos of the day. Morgan, this is the protest outside the Barnard Gates. <laughs> <laughs> you might have to kill like Dorch and Leithold or somebody. Because <laughs> uh, we didn't have them. <laughs> this is another of Morgan's photos. And <laughs> I never 
<laughs> I never noticed that until Morgan, Morgan the photographer pointed that out. And this is the leaflet that was handed out. And you know what's funny is people really don't realize this is before, you know, personal computers. So this was done on a typewriter and then the, the title was hand drawn on with probably a magic marker. That's the leaflet. And that's the diary. Okay. Um, if anyone is interested in the details, I can refer you to Carol Vance's epilogue to Pleasure and Danger, uh, which is the book of papers from the conference and my account uh, of it in my collection of essays, deviations, or the conference program itself, which is full of information about what actually happened at the conference. So there were panels on disability and class and race and aging and all kinds of stuff. Uh, it, it was quite varied. And the whole idea was to have a broader discussion of sexuality and not just focus on porn. Um, one result of the protests and the deluge of distorted press coverage is that the conference was understood primarily through the lens of the debates on pornography. And that is certainly an aspect of its background. But the conference was really much more an expression of other developments, especially the emergence of new intellectual frameworks for thinking about sex and particularly the histories and social structures of sexualities. This was the emergence of what came to be known as social construction was in this era. And then um, another context was the recent, then recent ascendance of the conservative right to political power. This was two years after Reagan was elected to the presidency. And when organizations such as Jerry Falwell's moral majority were among those pursuing anti-feminist, anti-gay, anti-queer, anti-abortion, uh, uh, agendas, much of which actually has been put into place, which is kind of scary to think about, some of it not. But uh, there now, of course, is a, a much more active attempt to put the rest of it in place, uh, whatever wasn't accomplished. One thing one can say about the conservative right is that they play the long game and they play it really well. In addition, uh, back to the Barnard Conference, it was also a manifestation of a resurgence a feminist interested in a feminist interest in sexuality more broadly conceived, wary of the narrow narrow focus on porn and the contents of that focus, uh, and much richer. So, for example, the uh, heresy sex issue, which was published in 1981, um, the uh, powers of uh, I'm sorry, the Barnard Conference, which was in uh, 1982. Uh, 1983 saw the publication of the Powers of Desire anthology edited by Ann Snittow, Sharon Thompson, and Christine Stanzel, and of course, Pleasure and Danger, uh, the papers from the uh, Barnard Conference edited by Carol Vance, which came out in 1984. So this was a period of ferment within feminism over issues of sexuality, uh, during which many trajectories converge. And as this period becomes history, Small errors such as those about, you know, what was going on at Barnard and who founded FACT and all these other kind of uh, easily checked facts. I mean, these are all in the published documents. You don't even have to go to the archives to get those right. These small errors are, uh, of easily determined matters of fact are symptomatic of a larger problem. Much of the current crop of literature on the sex and porn wars is profoundly ignorant not only of the details, but the issues and the stakes of these earlier conflicts. Some of this newer literature has not consulted even some of the published texts, much less come to the archives. So there's a growing tendency to pontificate on these earlier conflicts without understanding what was actually going on in them, and with a very limited sense of the analytic range and the contents of those debates, which Lisa points out in her review of Srinivasan. Moreover, much of what is accepted as history is simply the circulating narratives and assumptions about the events and the arguments. This is a larger problem, I think, with our entire intellectual and public culture, the tendency to just regurgitate whatever is on the internet or on social media and not actually doing research to find out what is true. Uh, it's something that drives me nuts every day. Um, <laughs> In any case, there, the inattention to primary sources often results in the reiteration of many myths about the sex wars or the acceptance of claims as established that were actually contested, such as that porn is uniquely pernicious uh, and all other media is, or that porn is responsible for the entire structure of oppression of women and gender stratification. Um, 
that is actually one of the ones that has been accepted uh, as if it's been proven. And another version that's, I've noticed this in philosophy journals, where the debates on porn are mostly over whether porn is a speech act. So the, the, this is really interesting. It, you'd think philosophers would go back to think about their premises. But if you start with the premise that porn is uniquely pernicious, pernicious and what you really want to establish is whether it's a speech act or not, because you're concerned about whether it can be protected by the First Amendment, and you don't go back to check on whether porn actually fits this description, then everything that follows is kind of irrelevant. Uh, it's just people accepting these premises and then trying to figure out if the law can be applied. And there are two things wrong with this. First of all, I leave the details of speech act theory to the philosophers. I'm not good at that. But actually, pornography has already been largely excluded from the protections of the First Amendment. So the whole argument over whether it's a speech act or speech is kind of irrelevant. The courts have ruled repeatedly that obscenity, which is the major legal category for regulating porn, is not protected by the First Amendment. So speech act or not, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then the other, of course, is that these approaches begin with a largely unexamined assumption, uh, these premises of which are usually une unexamined, that porn is uniquely bad, and therefore you have to figure out how to regulate it, rather than is this correct, a description in the first place. So part of why I want to revisit the beginning of these debates, I want to go through some of the ways that this characterization of porn was established, and what's wrong with the arguments that were used to establish it. So I'm going to focus on that. Uh, early anti-porn movement, particularly as I encountered in its formative phase, which was roughly 1977 to 1983. And boy, you know, looking back on how long it's been, I do feel I wore my dinosaur tie today. Because <laughs> <laughs> I do feel like, you know, an ambulatory fossil coming out of the matrix. Um, and on that note, I'm going to have to have a sip of water. <laughs> It's also impossibly long ago. Um, anyway, um, so just to review, the first feminist anti-pornography um, organization was in San Francisco. It was Women Against Violence in Pornography and Media. It was known as WavePAM. And WavePAM actually started to take shape late in 76, but it really became established early in 1977. And it ceased operating in 1983. It kind of fell apart in 1983. Um, Wei Pam then in 1978 held the first major feminist conference on pornography. Take, it was called, uh, the book based on that was called Take Back the Night. And that was the, um, uh, the, the book of the conference papers. It was published in 1980. And if you really want to know what the anti porn movement looked like, uh, you know, before 1983, you have to look at this book. It's, it's revelatory. Uh, that conference in 1978 that WAPIM put on is what sparked the formation of WAP, Women Against Pornography in New York in 1979. That did not emerge out of the snuff protest. That's a whole other trajectory. They emerged out of this conference um, in, um, in San Francisco and the New York people who came went back to New York and said, oh yeah, we need to do something like this. So they did. And then as WAPIM faded, WAP really became increasingly central to anti-porn feminism until it too closed shop. And I've been able to figure out exactly what year they closed shop, but it was sometime between 88 and 1990, as best I can determine. There were lots of other anti-porn groups, but none with the scope and influence of WAPM and WAP. And there's a second phase of the anti-porn movement that starts in 83, 84, in which some people mistake as the beginning of the anti-porn movement, and that was when um, Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin introduced their so-called civil rights anti-porn ordinance. Um, increasingly, the remaining anti-porn activists and organizations adopted the ordinances as their preferred goal, and it was to contest those ordinances that fact indeed was founded. Um, and that's a really different phase of the anti-porn movement than the early phase. So take back the night as sort of the early phase, and then the McKinnon Dworkin ordinance is the next phase. Um, then by uh, 1986, the ordinance had been declared unconstitutional in the United States, and many of the key remaining anti-porn activists shifted their attention um, to trying to abolish prostitution instead of porn. Uh, 
they migrated into a resurgent movement around trafficking, and they helped to make that movement uh, surge. But the wing of the movement in which they uh, uh, ended up is that which defines as its target not coerced labor and coerced and, and exploitation of migrants and so forth, but simply commercial sex and prostitution. Um, I was going to end this with a discussion of the anti-trafficking movement and the different wings of it and how they define trafficking. I'm not going to have time clearly today, so I'm not going to do that. But just briefly, uh, this particular understanding of trafficking, uh, while rooted in the larger history of anti-prostitution activism that goes back to the 19th century, is very much shaped by the conceptual frameworks and in many cases, the actual personnel from the anti-porn movement. Many of them have just migrated into anti-trafficking. Anyway, um, to re so to recap briefly, the chronology of the feminist anti-porn movement would be as follows. First, the era inaugurated by WAVEPAM, in which pornography became a major focus and many other issues kind of faded to the margins, which is one of the objections that feminists like me and Lisa and Carol and many others had about it. Like what happened to the rest of the agenda? Why are we only talking about porn now? Um, then there, the second, uh, then there's the ascendancy of WAP and New York, and then there's the turn toward the state with the ordinance. And then there's the transition uh, into activism against sex work, uh, which is, happens really around 88, 89. So um, I would argue, I mean, Carolyn Bronstein says it's only WAP that really starts. She, she thinks that WAP was the first real anti-porn organization. I disagree, I think it was WAPAM. It's true that before either of these organizations, there had been writers who had previously denounced porn, such as Susan Brown Miller, who spent several pages uh, denouncing porn in Against Our Will. That was in 1975. And it should be noted, Andrew Dworkin is often sort of retrospectively uh, uh, credited with starting the anti-porn movement, but she really didn't. And the book that she wrote on porno the, her book Pornography was not published until 1981, which is four years after the founding of WAPAM. Now she did have an earlier book, Woman Hating. Oh, this is a WAP demonstration. Sorry, I forgot to show you that. Where's <laughs> I don't know where this is. I'm imagining Times Square, but is it Times Square? Anyway. You can see the uh, the idea somehow that porn is responsible for violence against women, um, as if there are no other causes. Um, anyway, this was uh, Andrew Dworkin's earlier book, Women Hating, and it did have a section on pornography, but as you can see from the table of contents, it also had a section on uh, fairy tales, a discussion of foot binding, a chapter on witch burning, and a long and actually quite fascinating discussion of androgyny, um, and in this respect, woman hating was actually kind of typical of feminist tomes of the era. These often included chapters on the sexism of some genre of literature. And in, uh, in, in um, Dworkin's case, she picked on two uh, literary uh, SM novels from France, uh, Story of O and The Image, and then uh, Suck Mag I Suck, which I think was a magazine. I, I was trying to get a copy of the book today so I could check to see what the heck Suck was. But I think it was probably some magazine or, or what? I'm sure you have it. I just, anyway. <laughs> we could find out. This would be good. This is what's wonderful about archives. And I'm an anthropologist. I came to archives late in life. I was not trained in this, but I just love them. When I was at Harvard, I wanted to get a cot and move into the Schlesinger and just stay there. Uh, I, I spent a semester there. Unfortunately, not nearly enough time in Schlesinger. Anyway, um, so I want to compare this to another book from the era, Kate Millett's Sexual Politics. And you note that she also has a whole section on literature, much of which was at one time considered pornographic, D.H. Lawrence, Henry Miller, Norman Mailer, and Jean Genet. So, you know, the difference between what she's doing and what Dworkin is doing is not that great. They're both going after certain literatures uh, as part of the structure of sexism, but they have many other factors there. So what Dworkin is doing in Woman Haiti, even though she has a section called pornography, is not what the anti-porn analysis actually was when that movement happened. Uh, and the other thing to realize is that these scattered indictments of pornography did not lead to the formation of organizations. Um, 
or activism around porn, that only took off with the formation of WayPam. And, you know, watching WayPam kind of make porn the center of feminist um, concern, it, it, it felt to me like some sort of mutation, you know, like something weird had happened as it was so different from the way that most feminist criticism had operated up to that time. And I want to say that the pivotal figures uh, who founded WayPam were sociologists, uh, Diana Russell, who provided most of the analytic framework, Susan Griffin, the uh, writer and poet who contributed much of the rhetoric, and uh, Laura Letterer, who edited Take Back the Night and whose formidable in administrative skills probably account for a good deal of WayPam's swift consolidation and significant impact. Um, and in her book, Battling Pornography, Carolyn Bronstein uh, names Kathy Barry as another founder. Kathy Barry was the author of the 1979 book, Female Sexual Slavery, uh, which is, um, uh, and Barry, it's interesting, Barry was, I, I've actually been through the WayPam records at the GLBTHS, GLBT Historical Society, and she's not on the membership list, but she's clearly there at the demonstrations. There are photographs of her with the signs. So she was very involved. I don't know that she ever signed up. Um, and she would become increasingly salient in the late 1980s when all of this energy that had been focused on porn moved over to prostitution because that was her main interest was uh, sex work. So here's my story. I encountered Wei Pam myself when I first moved to the Bay Area in the spring of 1978, I was a grad student. I'd been hired to teach a class at Berkeley for one quarter on advanced feminist theory. <laughs> and uh, I had not yet, I didn't have a formulated position on porn or the anti-porn movement. And I wanted to learn more about it. And two of my best, brightest, most enthusiastic students, of course, they were deep into Way Pam and they said, hey, we'll take you to the slideshow, which they did. And I went, and that was, that was the experience that changed my opinion of all of this. I was completely open to a feminist critique of pornography, which would, if it had been like the feminist critiques of pretty much all other forms of media at the time, but that's not, I was, so I was familiar with that. I mean, we were critical of everything. Um, you know, everything from children's literature to the walls of the museums. So you could do that to porn, really, that was not a problem. I expected something from like that but it isn't what I found. And that's what really changed my attitude. This was something different and unlike any feminist experience I had previously encountered. One unique feature of the way Pam slideshows and later WAP was the limitations on discussion. No one in the audience was allowed to question the presentation, present alternative interpretations of the, of the images, get an explanation of the selection of the evidence or even get a clear definition of pornography. None of this could be brought up. We were now supposed to fervently oppose this thing without it ever being defined. And I was like stunned by this. So I started to try to ask questions and, and ask, you know, uh, what's the category? How are you defining it? Why this image or that one? I'll say a little more about that later. But no one was allowed to do that. You, they would say things like, now that you know how terrible porn is, let's see what you can do to stop it. That was it. And if you doubt me, there are two written accounts of the WAP slideshow in New York that are very similar. One was by Paula Webster and one by John D'Amelio, and they described the same thing, which is there was no discussion permitted. So I began to articulate my uh, questions, comments, and criticisms publicly and quickly became persona non grata and the target of personal attacks. And these kinds of attacks were a pattern of conduct that would uh, continue throughout those years. And as one of the reasons we call these, we call these the sex wars instead of the sex discussions. <laughs> you couldn't have a discussion. <laughs> there was no discussion. So all this is very old history in many respects. And the issue of porn uh, kind of abated within feminism, although I anticipate a reprise any minute. Um, Personally, I was relieved to see the anti-porn fever kind of subside because I wanted to work on other things. I've never actually been that interested in porn. I'm interested in regulation and the effects of regulation and what all of this meant for everything else that I was uh, wanted to know about. But I, I'm not a porn scholar, never have been and never will be. You know, there's now this journal Porn Studies. If anyone wants to get porn scholarship, you go to that or Linda Williams, those people, they actually study porn. Uh, I do not. So I've happily worked on other things since uh, the early 1980s, but 
while these wars receded and changed form, unfortunately, they never really ended. And the legacies of anti-porn feminism continue to shape a good deal of our current landscape of law policy and social action with respect to sexual conduct. So I think it's important to note how, first of all, how peculiar this obsession with pornography was in the context of feminist politics in the decade before the founding of WAPM. Early radical feminism and women's liberation were incredibly concerned with sex, sexuality, women's sexual pleasure, along with violence, rape, and battery, and a lot of other things. In the formative phases from the late 1960s well into the 70s, the assorted facts, fa uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> facets of the women's movement were concerned with pretty much every manifestation of gendered inequality and the uneven distribution of social goodies and liabilities and the mechanisms that kept those things unequal. The early publications such as Boston's uh, No More Fun and Games or Journal of Female Liberation and New York's Notes from the First, Second and Third Years, which were actually published, I just discovered today in 68, <laughs> 70 and 71, so they skipped a year, <laughs> but they still called it for a second and third. Well, anyway, but these early journals make this abundantly clear. These were two of the first kind of compilations of the kinds of discussions people were having. The first issue of notes uh, from the first year from 68 included a piece called Women Rap About Sex. It's a compilation of, a compilation of conversations that had been compiled by Shulamith Firestone. And it was mostly a litany of complaints by women about not getting their fair share of orgasms and sexual pleasure. That's in notes for the first year. It also included Ann Coates' very famous article, The Myth of the Vaginal Orgasm, one of the most widely read and frequently reprinted dissections of the prevailing assumptions about women's sexual anatomy, and which, uh, uh, which were really, was also basically a cry for more women's sexual pleasure. Um, this issue of notes also featured a funeral oration for the burial of traditional womanhood, speeches about abortion, whose illegality was a major concern of the movement, and subsequent issues of the notes were much more comprehensive and featured just a few of the topics, critiques, critiques of love, not just porn, but love, politics of housework, boy, that was a big one, economic discrimination, you know, at the time, Women were making, I don't know, 50 cents to the dollar. There was all this job discrimination. Frankly, when I went to college as an undergraduate, there were almost no women on the tenure, tenured faculty at any department except maybe nursing or something. But, you know, in history, we had actually the anthropology department in Michigan had two tenure track women and was, I think, the only other department that had uh, that many was psychology. And there was one in history, Sylvia Thrupp. But she was, <laughs> this is a really interesting story. She was occupying something called the Palmer Chair, money for which had been given in the 1930s to hire a woman uh, in the history department. The history department resisted for about 30 years and wouldn't hire anyone. And they tried to get uh, the, the terms of the endowment changed so they could hire a guy. And they finally hired Sylvia, who was a medievalist and really quite remarkable. Uh, but you know, there, there were very few women in and there was a, the glass ceiling was real. I mean, people, working class women aspired to be secretaries. I mean, it was hard to get above that. In medicine, you know, women were nurses, doctors were men. I, I could go on, but uh, this was a different world. And um, anyway, to get back to it. Uh, so, and also the other thing is women could hardly get credit. Women couldn't get credit cards. Women couldn't get mortgages. I mean, this, there were a lot of things that were, on everybody's mind. Uh, consumerism, the Miss America contest. There was an essay by T. Grace Atkinson going after the, quote, institution of sexual intercourse long before Andrew Dworkin wrote about intercourse. There were discussions of man-hating, class differences, the legal system, article, more articles on abortion, which was a major concern prior to Roe. If you read this early stuff, you see what a major, and it's about to be a major concern again or already is. There were essays on feminist history, black, fe black feminism, lesbianism, male violence, rape, and the classic article, one of my favorites, Why I Need a Wife, <laughs> on the many personal services which women routinely prefer, performed and men expected and enjoyed. Uh, and there were lots of articles on the sexism in children's books. That was a big topic, more than porn, children's books. And there were some articles on prostitution, but also a lot on marriage. 
there was just as much concern with marriage as an oppressive institution as prostitution. And in fact, there was a lot of pro-prostitution. Part, if you read notes from the first, second, and third year, one of the things that those women were doing was going and bailing women out of the women's house of detention who had been arrested on sex charges. Um, so what's notable about the literature from this period is the variety and range of concerns. No aspect of experience, no institution was spared feminist uh, critique. And inequalities at every level were examined and programs articulated to reconstruct the power differentials in every aspect of social life. Other big th themes were religion, the economy, of course, educational systems, marriage and family structures, sports. This was before Title IX. The law and, like I said, all of culture, all media. There were critiques of music, art, mass media, museums, movies, TV, advertising, and literature was a favorite topic, as you could see from Kate Millett. Um, and, and it's really interesting going back and seeing the special concern with children's books. That's really a, a major focus in this early literature. Um, there were also uh, intense conversations about the unequal distribution of, at that point, mostly heterosexual, sexual gratification. And everything was up for grabs, money, time, respect, housework, ego gratification, spiritual authority, who could be a, a minister or a priest or a rabbi, physical safety, personal service, and orgasms. And what's also notable is that if pornography was mentioned at all in any of this early literature, it was kind of in passing, you know, just kind of a throwaway in a list or something. Um, there's a lot less about porn than there is about children's books and marriage. So a major, um, the other thing I wanted to say is that a major cause, of, a major um, preoccupation in feminist writing in this period was the identification of what caused male supremacy and gender inequality. A huge amount of the early literature was concerned with trying to figure out why we were in this situation where men had all this power and privilege and women much less. So there were a lot of causes that were proposed. First, there was you know, the classic uh, Frederick Engels, private property, the family, and the state. Uh, there was the armed patriarchal revolt that also goes to Engels, but there was also capitalism, imperialism, the sexual division of labor, motherhood, mammalian reproduction, hormones, male propensities for violence. Um, the more fine-tuned analysis shied away from these major generalizations to focus on particular social structures such as theologies and institutions of major religions, specific economic arrangements like wage job segregation and, and low wages, um, and a whole bunch of laws restricting women's ability to function socially ed, um, or economically, and the multiple secular ideologies that rationalize male supremacy and sexual moralities. Um, again, I can't think of a single example from this period that indicted porn as a major cause of anything. Uh, so it, that was my background in feminist literature when I ran into the anti-porn movement. And I just thought many of its claims were frankly preposterous and frankly contradicted by all the data that we already had in the accumulation of feminist scholarship up to that time. I mean, if you'd read the feminist scholarship, you'd look at this and say, what are they talking about? And that was my uh, approach, or that was my reaction. However, there's more to the story. By the late 70s, porn too, uh, and how long do I, I've been going on. Anyway, I'll, I'll try to get through this. Porn too was in a um, state of, of historical transformation. I don't have time to go into great detail about the history of obscenity laws and their uh, relative relaxation in the mid to late 20th century. But just briefly, pornography itself is both a recent category and uh, it's never been an entirely stable one. The best book I know on this is Walter Kendrick's The Secret Museum. If you want to know how porn kind of gets different meanings over time, it's a wonderful book. And actually, until the late 20th century, pornography was not a legal category. Obscenity was a legal category. That's what got um, regulated. And the first federal obscenity law was the Comstock Act in 1873, which criminalized not only sexual material, but anything relating to contraception and abortion, which is important to remember. Um, and the Comstock laws were federal, so they only covered things crossing state lines or otherwise under federal jurisdiction sent through the mails or in Washington, D.C. or on a military base. So this, many of the states passed these many Comstock laws so that they could cover the same stuff within their state boundaries, within their jurisdictions. Um, 
one of the things to remember uh, is that these Comstock laws, obscenity laws, have made it easier to prosecute and censor sexual contents and other things one might find objectionable, such as violence or sexism or racism. Those things have First Amendment protections. Obscenity does not to this day. So obscenity laws were applied to broadly to a range of written and visual depictions of sex until modified by a series of court decisions over time, these resulted in removing a lot of materials um, from, the, um, from the obscenity uh, statute. So for example, contraception and abortion eventually got removed. But before that, uh, there were two consequential Supreme Court rulings, the Roth decision in 57 and Miller in 73, that actually said that there were ways that things were not obscene, like if they had redeeming literary or social value and so forth. So, what happens is things like D.H. Lawrence and The Well of Loneliness and Henry Miller get excluded from the category of obscenity. And what's left is sort of commercial smut, the cheap, often badly produced stuff that you would find in the adult bookstores. Um, and then the Secret Museum, which is this wonderful overview, Walter Kendrick said something I thought was really insightful. He said the trend was toward widening the definition of the non-obscene and narrowing that of its opposite which increasingly took on the label of pornography. Over a period of decades, obscenity was pared down like some fleshy fruit with an indigestible stone at its heart to lay bare what became known as the hard core. <laughs> this is wonderful. And that hard core was what was widely understood to be pornography by the late 70s, the sexually explicit, often crude, cheaply produced or reputable stuff that could still be prosecuted as obscene and which um, you had to sort of go to some adult bookstore, Times Square to get. Um, and there was another major group that was called Softcore, which was less, less explicit and often better produced, especially as presented in mass circulation magazines like Playboy and Penthouse, uh, which were by then mostly immune from prosecution. And I remember T. Kareen, T. Kareen telling me the difference between hard and soft core. She said, it's two inches, by which she meant no genital contact. <laughs> and that was the, you know, that was sort of the dividing line. What's happened over time, and Linda Williams has a wonderful piece on this, is that the notion of hardcore has shifted from explicitness and genital contact to kink. And that's part of what's happened over the last 40 years, but I don't have much on that in this talk. Anyway, social conservatives were still bitterly opposed to porn, hard or soft core. And if you want to know about that, um, you should look, read uh, Whitney Strub's uh, wonderful perversion for profits, great account of the conservative opposition to porn. But by making it more challenging to prosecute uh, pornography, both the Roth and Miller decisions encouraged more open dist distribution of porn and um, a proliferation of retail stores outside of the more traditional areas of sexual commerce. These, um, exp these expansion of porn shops provoked new forms of opposition and attempts to control them, which included, among other things, the zoning regulations developed by Detroit first, but which were then applied to such uh, so effectively to cleaning up Times Square under Giuliani, and new mobilizations of the right against porn, but also, I would argue, the feminist anti-porn movement. Now, you need to understand that porn at that time was really different. There was no internet. Well, there was an internet, but the internet was basically government people and IT geeks on university campuses. I mean, it, it wasn't a public thing. There was no, Nets, there was no navigator, no Netscape, no web, uh, no, gra no, no, no graphic interface. This was all mostly Unix and I don't know, Fortran and other things that I don't know how to do. Um, so the feminist anti-porn movement coalesced before even video recorders were common. I mean, they really sort of, VCRs were around in the late 70s, but they didn't really become a mass consumer product till the early 80s. The internet didn't become a mass consumer environment until the late 90s. This was 77. So most of the stuff that people are talking about is magazines and dirty books and uh, movies that you had to go to a theater to see or loops that you had to go to an arcade to see or, um, uh, you know, the sort of live entertainment, the strip shows and that sort of thing. So it was a whole other different world. Um, this was also before the availability of personal computers, which also took off in the early 80s, as you can see from that leaflet, which was clearly prior to computers. 
The documents of this period were done by hand or on typewriters. So the forms of pornography at issue were really different from what's available now. And, um, uh, but largely as a result of the Roth and Miller decisions, uh, cheap commercial smut, smut and mass circulation softcore magazines were more visible and accessible than they had been before. But you still had to leave home to get them. You couldn't just go to the VCR or your computer and get any of this stuff. Um, and it, it was uh, in this period, roughly around 76, 77, that I became both aware of both the porn of porn and the movement against it. Um, around 77, I met two lesbian feminist photographers, T. Corinne and Honey Lee Cottrell. Uh, Honey Lee is very well represented in the gallery. Um, they, they were both uh, pioneering um, new forms of lesbian erotic photography. And I th think I have some of T's. Yes. Um, just thought I'd show you a few of her photos, which I um, uh, have by permission of the T. Kareen Papers Special Collections and University Archives, University of Oregon Libraries. That's where T's material is. And this one, which has, it's called The Three Graces, has a lot of different body types. Uh, this one, which has uh, some disability imagery. And this one, which is very famous and was the cover of Sinister Wisdom and made into a poster. And I think I, oh yes. And then Susie mentioned this yesterday, another of T's productions, the famous cunt coloring book. And I'll leave that up while I do some more talking. <laughs> if I get bored, you can be distracted. If I get boring, you can be distracted. Um, anyway, they were the ones who first alerted me that there was some feminist movement against pornography and they were worried that it might imperil what was then a nascent genre of lesbian produced and lesbian focused erotica. And of course, eventually it did imperil that project. And I was just ignorant of porn at the time. I, you know, you just, as a, a female in that era, it was hard to actually see. We had a little store in Ann Arbor called the Blue Front, which is where you went to get like alternative newspapers and academic journals. And in the back, there was a rack of porn. And, you know, I never got to the rack because in front of the rack, there was this wall of the backs of the men who were standing in front of the rack. <laughs> and it was like the Great Wall of China. You know, you couldn't get through the, the guys to get to the porn rack. Um, so, um, uh, but I, so, but I, I began to be curious on what the heck people were talking about. And uh, this was after those legal cases that opened up opportunities for porn stores and downtown Ann Arbor actually had its own little tiny minuscule porn row, two porn shops and upstairs there was a brothel. And later on, one of those became the gay bookstore. <laughs> this was about 30 years later. So I wanted to check it out, but I was kind of scared to go in. You know, yeah, there was a sense it was a place of unknown peril and something bad might happen. So <laughs> Laura Engelstein was in town. Laura is a Russian historian who used to teach her. Actually, she was teaching her at the time and she was visiting. So I recruited her to be my buddy and go on an expedition to the local porn shop. So we, Laura agreed and we walked in and nothing bad happened. In fact, nothing happened. It was a very ordinary place aside from the wall of magazines with color photographs of naked people and visible genitals, mostly engaged in some kind of penetration. So there was the vaginal shelf and the, the, you know, the anal part and the oral part and the interracial part. In the very back, there was some gay porn. I mean, it was sort of thematically organized, but, uh, <laughs> you know, so people could find what they were looking for. <laughs> uh, in any event, most of it was pretty clearly sexist and very poorly produced, but I didn't think the sexism was markedly worse than that of mainstream media. I hope that's not my phone. No, okay. Um, so I was totally on board with the idea that there should be better, less sexist, more attractive, and more feminist porn. And a few months later, I was at the Wave Pam slideshow with my two students. And I realized that the actual anti-porn movement was not interested in better porn. They wanted to get rid of it altogether. And the case against porn, and this is sort of the core of what I wanted to convey today, was so dubious that it still stuns me how quickly this became hegemonic and people believed it and really smart philosophers to this day believe it and are just worried about whether or not it's a speech act. I mean, that's what's going on as far as I could tell in the philosophy journal. Anyway, um, the slideshow, this is from the Wave Pam script. 
describing the slideshow. This slideshow presents a spectrum of images which we consider pornographic. We consider pornographic. These images are found everywhere from books and magazines commonly recognized as pornographic to mainstream album covers and fashion photography. So already they've skipped from porn to something they consider pornographic. They range from the most blatant violence to the more subtly dangerous objectification. That's a really strange range of things. So they go on. Uh, some of the images were what was commonly considered porn. Other was, were just considered pornographic. And when I saw the slideshow, I was really struck by the variety of images, many of which were not what I would have thought were porn. So I wanted to know what exactly made them pornographic. Was it the sex, the sexism, the black stockings and the garter belt? the high heels, it was just really unclear what the criteria of inclusion were for this classification. And if I was gonna oppose pornography, I wanted a better definition. I wanted a clear category, a, a clearer category than one based on images that someone considered pornographic. I mean, there's a lot of things that people consider pornographic, like, you know, the. The, uh, the, the social conservative right thinks all gay stuff is pornographic. I mean, this was a very loose definition. So at the end of the slideshow, that was my first question. The first one I attempted to ask, how was Wei Pam defining pornography? The response was that question was not in order. Now that we had seen how awful porn was, the discussion was gonna be what we could do to stop it. There were in fact, a lot of disparate images from album covers and advertising which was by no definition legally pornographic. Some of battered women showing their bruises and injuries, it wasn't clear why that was pornography. I mean, it was distressing, but well, why was this porn? It was violent. The connection to porn was left unexplained. It was just kind of asserted and then they moved on. There were cartoons from the National Lampoon, text from sex manuals, an ad for breast enlargement, ads for makeup and scents, an ad for cellulite removal. Now I find much of the so-called beauty industry deeply offensive, but it wasn't clear to me what this had to do with pornography. Porn, especially the softcore magazines such as Playboy presented idealized bodies and no doubt generated pressures to use products and procedures to try to achieve such bodies. However, there was apparently no awareness that Hollywood movies and fashion magazines were at least as, as uh, responsible, if not dramatically more so for the promotion of unrealistic Ex expectations for female bodies. Why was it just porn? I mean, all you had to do was look at some fashion show to see these bodies that most people couldn't, and Hollywood actresses. I mean, they're, they're unicorns, you know, they're extreme cases. Um, so again, there were, there were slides referring to Hollywood movies for other reasons of sexism and violence, but it wasn't clear what that had to do with pornography. There was a slide referring to alleged snuff films as if there were actually a real genre of films made of real murders, made of, to film real murders of real women for sexual pleasure. There was no such genre at the time. I don't think there is now. Uh, and the original snuff film was actually a marketing hoax. It was not actually a murder of a real woman. It was a marketing hoax attached to a B-grade slasher film, uh, which Linda Williams details in a section in her book, Hardcore. Um, so, they, you know, what, what were the stuff movies they were talking about? There were a lot of images from what most people would in fact consider porn, the stuff sold in adult bookstores, but they were most, those were mostly kinky or extreme a thoroughly unrepresented sample of the stuff sold in those bookstores. So at the end of the presentation, I also tried to ask why the examples of porn were so selective and why the sample wasn't more representative. I was told the only discussion we were going to have was what you could do to stop porn. That was the answer to everything. And that was really weird. Every feminist presentation I had been to up to that point in my life, you got to do a Q&A and actually challenge people. I mean, you can challenge me later. <laughs> and probably will. But, you know, I, I just was stunned that you couldn't ask a question and get an answer. It was very weird. And these slideshows were indicative of the way in which the whole case was actually constructed. Skewed samples, arbitrary categories, and the suppression of dissent weren't flaws. They were features. And they were pervasive features. So I just want to briefly <laughs> go into 
the logic course I took as an undergrad when I was trying to be a philosophy major. <laughs> and I don't remember how to do a real formal logical, logical argument, but I do remember one thing that they taught us, which was called the informal fallacies. And the informal fallacies are something everyone should know about because they're, they're rhetorically persuasive, but they're not valid arguments. And there's a whole list of, actually, if you go on Wikipedia, there are about 300 of them now. When I took logic, there, logic, there were about 20. And it's a little easier to get the 20. But what I realized at some point is that the anti-porn analysis was a farrago of these fallacies. And that's all it was. Um, so let me, let me uh, briefly go through what the, the, the major fallacies were. The first one is called hasty generalization, also known as cherry picking evidence. And that's what happens when you basically pick examples or the evidence that supports a particular conclusion and avoid or ignore any evidence that does not. So you start with a conclusion and then you just find the evidence that's gonna support it. And you don't try to get a representative sample. This is one of the informal fallacies. And the anti-porn case was buttressed by focusing on the most, most loathsome and disturbing porn and treating those examples as if they were characteristic. Examples of more innocuous porn were ignored or there was no, dem uh, and there was no demonstration that the more disturbing images were the most common, and in fact, they weren't. You can't conclude something about a group or a phenomenon from a selection of the worst examples or manifestations. That's how racism, frankly, works uh, and lots of other forms of bigotry. You just find some bad example and say, all immigrants are criminals or something. I mean, that's, that's the way those arguments work. So the fact that there was clearly sexist, violent, or object objectional pornography, which there certainly was, was not sufficient to demonstrate that pornography as a whole was sex is violent or objectionable, or that it was more so than other forms of media. So the first was this cherry picking problem. The second fallacy is what's called false cause, which is taking two things and asserting that one causes the other without demonstrating the cause. Uh, so uh, much of the condemnation of porn was premised on the assertion that it was responsible for any number of undesirable social consequences, including rape and battery. The feminist anti-porn folks claimed that there was a vast increase in pornography over some unspecified period and a vast increase in violence against women over a similarly unspecified period. No statistics were given to demonstrate that there was even an increase, much less what the period was. So we don't know the time frame, we don't know the numbers, but nonetheless, they were saying, well, these happened at the same time, so clearly porn caused all this increase in violence. And um, <laughs> I remembered, uh, it's very easy to think that two phenomena that occur at the same time or in the same place are connected in some meaningful relationship of cause and effect, but coincidence and contiguity do not demonstrate causality. And my logic instructor explained this problem by using the example of the old story of the stork. I don't know if you've ever heard about storks bringing babies, but you're probably, many of you have not, but there was this idea that somehow, and if you go online and look for images of storks bringing babies, you will find hundreds of them. Um, so there was this idea that storks would come, land on the chimney, and a baby would come in the house. Well, the instructor said, even if there were a stork coming to land on the roof and build the nest, and even if a baby were born, it didn't mean the stork brought the baby. You know, you have to actually demonstrate that the claim that this is a causal connection. You can't just decide these two things happen at the same time, one or the other. That's one of the fallacies. The next problem, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll leave the stork up there. The next, this was made more challenging, um, this cause, how these, there were no adequate explanations for how these chains of causality were supposed to work, made more challenging by the construction of the category porn itself. As I noted, the term was not used consistently. Sometimes it referred to Playboy, sometimes to the contents of adult bookstore, often to all images that were either sexist or violent or contained images or suggestions of gender violence. And classifying all images of gender power or violence as pornography comprised kind of the third major fallacy. This one is what's called begging the question, which most people use without realizing what it means technically. It's used a lot these days to mean screaming for a question to be asked, but that's not what begging the question means in logic. It's a term of art that means essentially starting out with a premise that includes your conclusion. 
So you prove the conclusion by starting out with a premise that contains the conclusion. You just use different language for the two moments. Uh, there's a Latin term for this, which I probably cannot pronounce, petitio principii, something like that. That's the technical term. And, uh, but actually, it's, uh, it really means to assume the truth of what you're seeking to prove in the effort to prove it. You start out with your conclusion already in your premises. So uh, one textbook st states that this petitio principii is always valid. It's essentially a tautology, but it's almost always worthless as well. You're not proving anything. You're just restating something in different language. Uh, another term for this is circular argument. So they're endemic to the anti-porn literature. The way in which this operated goes back to my initial question about the definition of porn, which was what was the category? If pornography is defined by, uh, by and the category is composed of things which one finds sexist or violent or objectionable, then pornography is by definition sexist, violent, and objectionable. And if you look carefully at the anti-porn literature, that's pretty much how it works repeatedly. So, but if all porn is equated with sexism and gender violence, then it is even less clear what the specific role of sexually explicit media is in, or in adult bookstores is. And Ellen Willis, in one of the very earliest critiques of the then nascent anti-porn rhetoric, called this tactic of slippery definition simply, quote, playing games with the English language. <laughs> no one ever said it better. So those, that's really kind of how the um, the arguments worked. And then if none of that worked, there was the fourth informal fallacy, the, the well-known ad hominem, which means attack the person. So instead of arguing the point, you attack the character of your opponent. Oh, you can't believe what he says. He's just a scumbag. You know, can't believe what she says. She's not a feminist. She's pro-patriarchy. She's something worse, whatever it is. And that's what happened. Uh, in 1982, Robin Morgan denounced a bunch of us and asked how we dared call ourselves feminists. I don't know how Robin Morgan got appointed as the Pope with powers of excommunication, you know, but she seemed to think she had them. And in a 1990 collection based on this conference, the sexual liberals and the attack on feminism, they made a book out of it. Sure, there's a conference and then a book. T. Grace, Kathy, Kathy Berry, Susan Brown Miller, Dwork, and Sheila Jeffries, McKinnon, Robin Morgan, uh, yeah, and, and Gloria Steinem. Too. Um, anyway, in the book that came out of this conference, Sexual Liberals in Tech and Feminism, here's what McKinnon said. Quote, the Black movement has Uncle Tom's and Oreo cookies. The labor movement has scabs. The women's movement has fat. <laughs> so... That's ad hominem. I mean, you just, it's a, you don't have to listen to their arguments because they're scumbags. So, and uh, just so you know, this is the booklet that FACT put out, Caught Looking, and it's a wonderful compilation of a lot of the arguments against the anti-porn movement. At the time that this all happened, the anti-porn argument should have been assessed and evaluated as was the usual procedure in the movement. Instead, opposition to pornography became identified with feminism itself, and the claims about it became ever more inflated. For example, in her 1983 book, Right Wing Women, Andrea Dworkin helpfully included some diagrams to illustrate what she considered the significance of both pornography and prostitution. Here we have the condition of women. <laughs> pornography, battery and rape and exploitation and prostitution. Or another one, Prostitution as the material reality, pornography as the underlying ideology. And the third one, pornography as the surface phenomenon, prostitution as the underlying system. I mean, this is nuts. <laughs> Just completely nuts. <laughs> Whatever happened to, you know, religion, private property, the state, the economy, lack of credit, you know, all the, all the stuff we used to talk about, it's all gone. And what you see here is a narrowing of the very concept of male supremacy to porn. I mean, there's no, there's nothing else left. It's just porn and prostitution. And since I had been marinated in all of this literature in the early, early women's liberation that so exhaustively explored the causes and forms of gender subordination, I was flabbergasted, frankly, to see these diagrams and to hear people talk this way. I want to know where all the other institutions, ideologies, and structures of gender stratification went. How did they get supplanted by porn and prostitution? And what, was, what were we supposed to make of societies 
that had clearly, clearly had gender inequality, but neither porn nor prostitution, of which we know of many. Uh, so anyway, by the time Dworkin's Right Wing Women was published, the argument over porn had clearly shifted. The first iteration was that porn caused violence. The second was followed by claims that porn was violence by itself. And eventually pornography was elevated to the primary cause of all of our problems of gender stratification. Just everything else went. And as I said, pornography became a replacement for male supremacy. Um, do I have time to say a quick thing about the internet um, and then conclude? I've got about three pages left. I, I'll just share roll through it. Okay, I know people need to go, but anyway. I want to conclude with a quick caveat about online porn. And the caveat is I have no idea because I don't do porn online. I mean, I am so computer IT challenged. I wouldn't know where to look for porn. And I'd be afraid I'd get into some place I don't want to go and get arrested. So I don't even bother. You know, I just don't do it. Um, <laughs> so um, it's certainly true that porn now is quite different from the porn that generated all of these arguments 40 years ago, well, more than 40 years ago. Porn has gone online, and I often hear the claim that online porn is especially violent and more extreme and more sexist. And since I don't go online to look at it, I have no idea. But I am hearing the same arguments I heard, you know, decades ago about this. And I'm deeply skeptical that they're any more accurate now than they were then, and for some of the same reasons. So one example is the claim that online porn is increasingly violent. Is it really? I don't know, but my suspicion is that, well, there's probably some really god awful stuff online. I bet there really is. It's probably as unrepresentative of the vast majority of what's online as were the selective images in the Wavepam slideshow, you know, years ago. Um, I suspect that this is sheer speculation that porn online is probably as varied as it ever was, maybe more so. And Actually, some of the more recent crackdowns on online porn that happened after these two federal laws were passed against trafficking, the pasta sesta laws, apparently fell more heavily on the good stuff, the feminist, the queer, the artistic, the inventive, while leaving mainstream porn largely untouched. So there probably is that, that pressure on uh, online porn that, um, uh, that does skew it somewhat, but I, I don't know. My other suspicion is that there probably is some really nasty stuff out there in porn land, but I wonder if it's any nastier than the neo-Nazi racist and male supremacist ravings that have proliferated online and in social media. If there's increasingly violent or loathsome porn, it may reflect less about porn than the tendency of online communication to drag almost everything it touches into some slimy pit of bottom feeders that seems to seem to thrive in the digital universe, uh, by which I mean, well, I, I once heard a speaker observe that the comment section of news stories online was where hope goes to die. And I thought that's really, because after a while you start to get just, you know, the fascist and the racist and the nasty and the homophobic. And, you know, it's like people feel entitled because they're not actually looking at you face to face and they're hiding behind their computer screen to say this stuff in a way that's really kind of, it should be shocking at this point, I'm not shocked. Um, but I'm wondering if the, uh, I leave the assessment, uh, I, I, well, I guess I'm wondering if online porn is any more immune to these tendencies uh, than political expression is. And if whatever is going on that's bad in porn is, isn't similar to what's going on elsewhere. And again, I'm not in that universe, I can't make a judgment, but I would just urge some careful thought about it for those of you who do know what's going on. Um, I just would caution against accepting the, the claims the, of the unique and special malevol malevolence, well, sorry, malevolency of online porn without some empirical verification, uh, which didn't happen the last round. I've heard all these arguments and assertions before, and uh, I just wonder you know, if they're not being repeated. So just to conclude, there's way too much to do these days, too much to, prote to protect, so many fights to have, so much of what the feminist movement and other movements for positive social change have accomplished is endangered. But at least the stakes around things like legal abortion and transgender treatment and outrages at the US border and the immigration, uh, the actions of the immigration police are reasonably clear. The issues around porn and trafficking have been less obvious 
uh, in their assumptions and impact, I think. So I hope I've at least been able to contribute to what I hope is an increasing skepticism toward the narratives about porn. And unfortunately, I didn't get to the ones about prostitution, but I'm happy to talk about them in the Q&A that have become such a significant part of our current cultural and political landscapes. Oh, and I don't want to leave you. Yeah, I'm going to leave you with this. <laughs> this is the um, centerfold of the Barnard um, uh, statement, the pleasure and danger statement from the diary. And it's more entertaining, I think, than more elevating than uh, Dworkin's diagrams. Um, and I hope as new voices and new constituencies try to bring back these sex wars and put such a positive spin on, on uh, on them that there is more skepticism about their claims and more careful examination of the histories and the programs that are being proposed. And I also hope that today and tomorrow we can celebrate something else, which is the courage, creativity, and brilliance of the ladies and butches and gender queers and others who decided back in the teeth of all of this prevailing antagonism toward erotic imagery in the early 80s that it was time to have a magazine for lusty lesbians and their friends, lovers, and comrades. Here's to you all. Thank you. So we have time for questions. And um, if you have a question, raise your hand and Sean will bring you the microphone then you can, and Gail will choose you, and um, <laughs> then you may speak. And I will also watch the questions that are in chat and, and read those for our, our visitors online. Okay. Thanks so much, Gail. Thanks for putting, uh, you know, uh, brevity is not my strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> We have a we have a customer. <laughs> Hi, thank you. That was wonderful. And having been through around the periphery of that in New York, it's great to hear it from uh, a long view. Forty years, wow. I want to know what you think of all this crap about the the porn rings, the the Hillary Clinton, and the in the Pizza Gate, oh, and God. the. I mean, is that related to this or is this totally well, it is and it isn't um you know i teach a course on what i call sex panics and a lot of what we look at in that course is the emergence of certain uh discourses around uh sex offenders for example going back to the 1930s and 40s uh some of the issues around kids and sex some of the issues around sex work and, and trafficking i was going to do all sexual trafficking which i didn't get to do um, and what has happened recently, that stuff has already, it, it's been problematic for decades. And part of what I do in this class is that I, you know, we go through kind of how these things got constructed and what their effects were and how they fell on mostly like gay men and many of the other uh, problems with it. But um, I feel like it's sort of like all that stuff has been so weaponized recently. I feel like you know, I, I open the, I get online or I read a newspaper and I feel like things have stepped out of my syllabus and onto the, you know, front pages. And it's it's kind of like, you know, anthrax is deadly, but when it's weaponized, it's worse. And I feel like QAnon has taken some of these already very problematic structures and essentially weaponized them. And yeah, this idea that Hillary Clinton was running a sex trafficking, a child trafficking ring out of a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C., out of the basement and it doesn't even have a basement and people still believe this and want it investigated it, it's completely nuts and uh i can't i it's not my area of competence there's a book called pastels and pedophiles which is about QAnon, which i haven't read yet so i don't know i can't say anything about it but it's really uh, okay good i have it on my shelf it's one of those oh and <laughs> susie knows it um <laughs> but you know QAnon is it all this stuff is kind of really amazing. And the idea that all the Democrats are 
you know, eating babies and drinking their blood and, and, and running sex trafficking rings. And pedophile has now, it's like worse than communist or Nazi. It's, you know, it was really interesting. I saw Timothy Snyder talking about the way Putin uses Nazi and he says it really has no content. It's just everybody you, you can hate uh, and dehumanize. And that's how pedophiles being used these days. It has no relationship to pedophilia. It's just, it, just like the Putin's the use of Nazi has no relationship to Nazism. Um, and it, it, it's, it's even in people who should know better, like I saw Rachel Maddow do a really great segment on Putin's use of pedophilia and planning child porn to try to completely discredit people. Um, and she starts out by saying pedophilia, it's the most evil thing on, you know, that you could possibly imagine. Well, first of all, I think really a lot of evil things. There's a certain hyperbole that gets into this language, but beside that, she doesn't understand that pedophilia is not child molestation. Pedophilia is a diagnostic term for people with a certain set of emotions, and child molesters are not are often not pedophiles. So, you know, it's like a Venn diagram. Yeah, there's pedophiles and there's child molesters, and there's an area of overlap, but they're really different things. So she was essentially you know, just kind of spouting this nonsense and then did a beautiful section on, on Putin. So it's very distressing actually to see the Pizzagate thing has morphed into a vast uh, online and social media discussion, you know, in which everybody you love to hate, including all Democrats, um, you can just call them those names. It, it's quite, I mean, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, I've been trying to follow it, but it's actually proliferated so rapidly. Oh, and then in the hearings for poor Katanji Jackson Brown, you know, the truth of the matter is the child porn laws were kind of nuts when they were passed because they criminalized things like you could be 18 or 17 years and 11 months and 20 days, and that's child porn. When you hear the term, usually people think toddlers or babies, but actually the, the range of what's illegal goes up to you know the 18th birthday, at least in the federal law, as I understand it. And it criminalized things like nudity. So, you know, ethnographic films with naked kids running around are technically child porn. And I was just watching um, uh, recently The Godfather, and there's a scene in Godfather 2 where young Fredo is getting treated with cups for pneumonia, and he's a baby, and you can see his little baby peenie. And that's child porn, technically. And so, and then there's the whole story of Jacqueline Livingston, which some of the folks here at Cornell know all about. This woman who, photographer, who was just destroyed by, uh, you know, because she took pictures of her kids, uh, which were, and there are a number of stories like that. There's Sally Mann, there's uh, Marilyn Zimmerman in, at Wayne State. These are feminist photographers who thought it was important to document you know, the real bodies of their children, but this is technically child porn. So the laws themselves started out kind of, you know, with a, a number of assumptions that I think were questionable, way too broad, and, and a lot of assumptions that never got questioned. But of course, they've become more and more intensified over the years. So for example, the original child porn laws, it was assumed that taking a nude picture of a child under 18 was itself a form of abuse. So it was the taking the picture that was illegal in the original, uh, the way the laws were written. Possessing it was not a crime. Well, now possession is a crime. And now these laws were written before the internet. So in order to possess more than one image, you know, you had to actually go out of your way. Well, now you can apparently download, you know, hundreds, you know, in a heartbeat. So the sentences have become, you can get harsher sentences for downloading some pictures off your computer than for actually murdering a kid. You know, I mean, the, so the sentences are crazy and the judges know this and they're trying to fix the sentences so they're a little more related to the actual crime. And so she gets raked over the coals for being one of hundreds of judges who feel this way about these sentences. So there's a lot. There, this is just an enormous area of of uh, it's complicated and there are a lot of issues to to sort through, but it's distressing that it's just become a kind of political weapon like weaponized anthrax. And uh, it's been injected into our political ventilation and hard to escape. And uh, it's, it's very distressing to me. So I, I hope that answers your question. Hi, uh, I have a, a question from chat and, mm -hmm. and I just wanna share that comments are rolling in from the over 100 people who've been watching virtually. Um, one question from Julia is whether you have any recommendations of books that get 
the history of the sex wars mm. accurately. And I'm wondering if you could, we can um, promise to put that list of books, if there is, um, online when we share this recording? Well, uh, first of all, there's Pleasure and Danger, which has got the, a lot of the accounts of what happened at Barnard. And the second edition has a separate piece by Carol that was also printed in a law journal. Uh, it was printed elsewhere, kind of, it's called More Pleasure, More Danger, I think. Uh, so those two are very good about Barnard and the events at Barnard. Uh, Lisa Dugan and Ann Hunter have their book, The Sex Wars, which has a lot of great stuff in it. Uh, a lot of, you know, terrific commentary. It's a wonderful book. Um, the Carolyn Bronstein book on the porn wars is mixed. The first three chapters are basically saying, trying to rationalize why the anti-porn movement came about by looking at the, the, the 60s. And they're based on secondary literature and they're sort of, I think, a skewed reading of, of, of that literature to kind of build up to the anti-porn movement. I think they're fairly useless. But then Carolyn Bronstein actually went to the archives and the chapters on Wave Awe, which was the first, uh, this feminine, Women Against Violence Against Women, which was an anti-media uh, violence group, not an anti-porn group. That's excellent. The chapters on Wave Pam and WAP are archivally based. She went to the archival uh, collections for all three of those groups and really used them. They're really useful. Where the book starts to fall down again is when she gets to the opposition because there aren't yet a lot of archives. And so that becomes kind of murky and very not as precise. So, you know, she has things in there like I was there in San Francisco upset by Wave Pam in 77. I was still in Ann Arbor taking my prelims. You know, I, I don't know how she got me to San Francisco. So, you know, it, it, there's stuff like that. And, it, and this, these are, again, these little details, but the big picture is also not very good there. The other problem with that book is she gets very sympathetic to the anti-porn people. And she interviewed a bunch of them. She didn't interview any of the people who were opposed. So it becomes after a while, so there's this one moment, for example, when she's talking about, but there's a lot of great data in that. She's talking about the Times Square when WAP is having their tours of Times Square and some sex workers come to WAP and say, why are you trying to destroy, destroy our livelihood? These are poor women of color who are sex workers. And they say, everyone will be better when there is no prostitution. <laughs> and, and Bronstein says something like, well, you can understand why they said that. And I'm sitting there kind of, you know, tearing out my hair. Uh, because so she starts to kind of apologize for them and 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 other voices don't but there's still a lot of really amazing material in that book about those three organizations um, and then the Brenda Kus, uh, Kospin book I again I haven't read a lot of these newer ones but she has a chapter on the sex wars that is largely pretty good um, uh, I didn't find a lot of you know, crazy howlers. And she was part of the group that was trying to fight, uh, you know, the, the censorship in Canada after the Butler decision was, uh, came down. And she was one of the editors of the book, Bad Attitude, uh, what is it, something on trial in Canada. That's a good collection about what happened in Canada after some of these uh, feminist anti-porn ideas were actually made into Canadian law by the Canadian Supreme Court in a major decision. So that uh, the old book is good, bad, um, bad attitude, and uh, the new one looks good, but I haven't finished reading it. Um, I'm sure there's more, but that's what I can think of off the top of my head. Who's who's got the mic? Yeah, hi. I do. <laughs> um, thanks so much for this talk. It was so cool. Um, I I know you talked a lot about how uh, anti-porn groups showed these images that were very violent that weren't representative of a lot of mainstream porn, but I know you also like worked closely with Pat Califia and like, you know, were involved in how we now think about like SM mm -hmm. imagery. And I was curious, like um, how you presented um, SM to other feminists at the time and whether that changed over the course of the sex wars. Huh. Not sure how to answer that. I mean, <laughs> Sam Wah, which was the lesbian SM group in San Francisco, did educational programs, uh, uh, you know, that we were open to the public. And we did a bunch of that. And we did a lot of events. We did women's leather dances and uh, contests and, you know, just try to. And then there was the book Coming to Power, which we, which we published. So there was a lot of that. Um, but I will, I will say this about SM and WAPAM, which is that... Um, you know, when we first ran into Wade Pam, we wanted to 
talked to them, we thought they had really bad ideas about SM. I mean, they basically said in their newsletter, they wanted to get rid of all images of women in bondage. And they would equate those with women being killed. And, you know, they just, it, it was <laughs> a very vague notion of what actually was at stake. So we tried to talk to them and they actually treated us kind of like uh, Putin is treating, <laughs> you know, I shouldn't say that. We, they treated us as if we weren't really part of the same human group that, you know, gets to talk to you. And, and it was interesting. We said, oh, you know, why don't you come show us your slideshow and, and we can talk about it. Well, they were afraid we'd get turned on. So they wouldn't bring the slideshow. And then, uh, <laughs> you know, it was like really crazy. And then, um, then this conference, this uh, Feminist Perspectives on Porn, uh, Pat and I tried to go. We had credentials from the Lesbian Tide to cover it as reporters. And uh, we were met at the door and, and, and told, we, we know that you're not anti-porn. You're not, well, they basically escorted us out. They wouldn't let us in. So, you know, that was when they complained about Barnard, quote unquote, excluding the uh, uh, anti-porn people. I thought, well, you know, no one excluded them. They just weren't on the program, but we were literally kicked out of the WAPAM conference. So it wasn't just the presenters, the audience was supposed to agree with them. So there were a lot of issues around that. I'm, I don't think this quite answers your question. Um, yeah, Susie. And she um, now started. Back. Oh, <laughs> Morgan Gwenwald is here, uh, and she was one of the people whose photography was in Coming to Power, mm -hmm. and oh, yeah. um, and Honey Lee Cottrell sadly um, passed away in 2015, but certainly was was also a photographic contributor. It's kind of funny because I know Morgan and Honey didn't like let's talk and decide how we're going to present the you know it wasn't like yeah. the, it was a meeting, but. Um, that I think we're going to be talking more about that tomorrow, or Morgan might even want to say something now. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I, I want to say one thing while you're delivering the microphone. I, I didn't ever saw my job as explaining SM exactly to feminism. That I had a lot of jobs, but that wasn't exactly it. But I did write, <laughs> I did write a piece in Coming to Power called The Leather Menace, in which I tried to explain why a lot of the feminist critique around SM was uh, was misguided and. That was that. It's reprinted in my collection deviation. So, how was that received at the time? <laughs> well, I think that would depend on. I, I don't know because I don't do reception studies. You know, a mix. I think. All right. You know, the book. The book uh, coming to power was was uh, a lot of the feminist publications wouldn't run ads for it. The bookstores wouldn't carry it. So there's a lot of controversy. But other people think it changed their lives and they loved it. Uh, but you know, you'd have to. Do a, you'd have to ask a lot of people that I never really spoke to about the book. All so. right, I have, I'm gonna uh, read one more question from uh, chat and maybe time for one quick question if you have a burning question here. Um, there's a question from someone you know, Gail Lynn Camella. Oh, and she hi says, Lynn. <laughs> she says, hi, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, my question, you ended your talk with an image from the conference diary from the Barnard Conference. Administrators at Barnard, as you know, confiscated the diary before the start of the conference, mm -hmm. which added a layer of official censorship mm -hmm. to the event. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about that and about how issues of academic freedom mm -hmm. and campus free speech also got caught up in the feminist porn wars? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, I can talk about the diary uh, before the conference. The diary. Sorry. That didn't sound good on. Uh, this is the diary. And it was done as a, a program for the conference. So it had the workshops and the speakers. And uh, it also had the letter of invitation uh, that Carol sent out the, uh, to get people to come and be on the planning committee. It had minutes of the planning committee. It had all kinds of wonderful stuff. And it was done by this graphics group that was really inventive. They did the heresy sex issue and they later did the cover to coming to power and they did a lot of the graphics and the graphics were, you know, they're, they're really well done and they're very inventive and so forth. One of the things that Serena Vassa did was she describes this as a zine. It's not a zine, it was a program of the conference. I, I mean, yeah, but zines are a genre that multi, uh, anyway, uh, it was just strange to read that. So before the conference, um, days before, apparently women from WAP called the Barnard administration and said, you know, sex perverts are coming to your campus and there's this diary and it's pornographic. So the administration confiscated all the copies of the diary. 
So this really was kind of crazy because this was the program. So I think, I'm trying to remember, I think probably the organizers did a little quick sheet of the events so that we could find our way around, but basically all the information wasn't there. So this helped in the sort of distortion of what was happening at the conference that people didn't have all the information of, uh, you know, like all the varieties of the workshops. My, one of my jokes is that the, 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 the conference was characterized as, you know, all pleasure all the time, but actually it was pleasure and danger. That was the way that people were talking about it. And if you want to know about the, the workshops, I'm just going to go in here for a second. There was power sexuality, the organization of vision. There was one on Lacan. Lacan was big at the time. Political organizing around sexual issues, which was mostly about abortion. Uh, the pornography and the construction of the female subject, which was all about how it was interesting. This was about porn and the construction of the female subject, but it was also about how other media also contributed in structures to the construction of the female subject. So it wasn't singling out porn, I'm sure the WAP people, but they didn't actually know what was going on. They just kind of decided that they thought what they thought was going on. There was one about teen romance, everything you wanted to know about sex literature, uh, beyond the gay straight split, sexual roles, butch femme that transcend sexual preference, sexuality and creativity, a theater workshop, um, let's see, what else do we have? Aggression, selfhood, and female sexuality, rethinking psychoanalysis, class, cultural, and historical influences on sexual identity, um, in defense of the, the defense of sexual restriction by anti-abortion activists, there were two on abortion, the politically correct, politically incorrect sexuality, uh, one that was um, also very controversial, the myth of the perfect body, age, weight, and disability, uh, eroticism and taboo, sexual purity, maintaining class and race boundaries. Uh, my concepts for radical politics of sex, there was one about sex and money. So you can see it was like pretty varied. Anyway, people didn't have the program, but the, the, the designers had copyrighted the program. So they were able to force the Barnard administration to reprint the diary. It was mailed out to people four months later. So it was a little late, but the diary did get reprinted and they had to take off the name of the funding entity, the Helena Rubenstein Foundation. I can't remember if there are a couple other small changes, but mostly it's the information is intact. Um, so uh, at that point, uh, people had the diary, but it really messed up the conference not to have this on the day. And I can't remember what else Lynn asked. <laughs> Hi, Lynn. Um, what else did she ask? The broader question of academic freedom is just, I'm going to leave that one alone, but uh, which, what, which was the, what's the provenance of that document? If it was, well, the other thing is that this was the, uh, the one they reprinted, but then they, they did a second edition. So this is actually the second edition of the reprinted diary without the funder uh, on the masthead. <laughs> And the people who did the diary gave me a few copies to distribute. And I realized that it wasn't clear that Brenda had one here. And there is one in the Honey Lee papers, but I thought they should have one they could catalog separately because then it's easier to find. So here it is for the, the local. So y'all can look at it. <laughs> We don't know if anyone has any copies of the original brochure. There are a the handful University. of the original ones, okay. but they are very rare and they're in private hands, I think, mostly. I don't know if, it, if any have hit institutions yet. All right. If anyone with those private hands is listening, we'd like <laughs> to have a copy for the library. Um, I want to invite you all to spend a few minutes looking at the exhibit and please thank me and, and th thank you. Join me in thanking <laughs> Gail for coming today. And, and thank, thank you, thank you for having me, and thank you all for patiently listening to my rather lengthy uh, uh, presentation. <laughs>